uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, you know, whichever region of the world you are in. Um, my name is Alok Pant. Actually, most of you know me, um, and I'm CEO of Unwired, based in uh, Texas, in Houston. And the topic of today's webinar is, you know, jumpstarting your machine learning or AI initiatives now. Um, you know, as we were talking to our customers, we found that a lot of people want to start thinking about AI ML, but they, it's confusing and it's not easy to you know, figure out where to get started. You know, there's so much noise and so many options. So we wanted to kind of discuss this with, with our customers and see how we can help you with that journey. Um, so before we go uh, deeper, uh, let me just share some housekeeping notes here. You can submit your questions through the chat um, uh, at any time. Uh, we will open it up to Q&A at the end. Uh, you can also sp uh, you know, speak up and ask your questions. And we are um, giving a special offer for all attendees today. Um, you know, we are giving a, offering a discounted proof of concept. And also, should you go to production, uh, we'll um, give discounted pricing for actually the solution in production too. So here is a quick look at the agenda. Um, we will give you a quick overview. So as most of you know, Unwired has, is very strong in, in digital solutions with you know, web apps and mobile apps and automating business processes. Uh, we are not AI ML experts, so we have teamed up with our partner Hypercurve, and we'll give you an overview of that company very soon here. It's a company based out of California. They focus on AI ML. So uh, this is a joint uh, webinar. Uh, we, we are going to just quickly discuss uh, what is, define some AI ML terms. So we're all on the same page. Um, then we'll talk about how do you take data, right? And how do you go to decision making using ML? And what are the steps that one has to take? We'll discuss some potential use cases, specifically hone in on a use case we are discussing with a customer, which should be of interest to most of you. And then, you know, why uh, Unwired and Hypercurve, Hypercurve solution makes sense. How does it compare with the alternatives? You know, there is Amazon, there is Google, uh, Microsoft, everybody has solutions in AI ML. We want to kind of, you know, articulate our differentiation there. And then finally, I think this is most importantly, how do you get started on a POC, right? Well, quickly and, and cost effectively. And then we'll do a demo also and hope that Srini will resolve his audio issues. Um, and then we'll do some Q&A. So with that, a very quick overview of Unwired. Uh, we're an SAP certified partner, do digital solutions, have custom apps and our standard apps also. Uh, our customer base is global. Uh, you know, most of our customers are in USA, Canada. And then as you can see, we have customers in Europe and, and other parts of the world too. Um, our key differentiators, I think the most important differentiator that we have is that we have happy reference customers. Uh, you know, customer delight is one of our five values. And, you know, simply put, we are really passionate about our customer success. And then all the other things follow, right? Yes, we are cost effective. We can do hybrid implementations. Also, we are very flexible. Uh, we like to listen to customer requirements and, you know, and are happy to change course as needed. Uh, and then a quick um, uh, snapshot of the recognition we've got from 2015 when Gartner first recognized us for our mobile apps uh, to 2022 where Gartner again recognized us for our uh, you know, uh, app dev platform. We've been continuing to get our accolades. Um, and with this, I'm going to stop here. And Srini Kumar is our guest today. He's CEO of Hypercurve, which is a company based in Silicon Valley, California. And Srini, uh, why don't you take a minute to introduce uh, Hypercurve and Digitizer for, for, to the audience? Sure. Thank you, Alok. Um, my name is Srini Kumar, and I am the founder and CEO of a, uh, a startup called Hypercurve, and we're based out of Silicon Valley. Our goal in starting this was to make it affordable, to make affordable AI, to infuse it into operations. And to that end, we've created a platform that is cloud-based, and it's called the Digitizer. And uh, that's about it. So I'll let Alok continue, and uh, we'll be able to hopefully give you a little demo. Great. And so Digitizer is a cloud-based platform that actually enables uh, machine learning uh, models to be deployed and maintained over the life cycle of a model. And we'll talk about it because, uh, so let's dive in. This is a good segue into, so what is AI ML, right? So just, and by no means are we going to do a thesis here. The focus of the webinar is a very practical approach 
to this whole um, uh, area and really deploying this technology. So uh, AI is the, the broad field where you know systems are being trained to act and think like humans, to do tasks that humans do. So that's the overarching field. Machine learning or ML is a subset of AI that uses neural networks, among other things, to, to enable AI. And then, and, and now, of course, uh, you can't have an AI webinar without talking of generative AI. So this is the new thing where uh, chat GPT, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. NetNet, -net, what you do is you give an input, it could be a text input, it could be an image input, and generative AI software will create the output for you. So you can you know, give a snippet of code and produce code. You can have um, chat GPT write a poem about machine learning itself, for example. So you can do all kinds of things, right? But today we are going to focus, and of course there's a lot of concern and risk about generative AI, but today's webinar will focus on the more traditional AI ML, if you will. Um, so which is, how do you get to, to decision making from data? So we've we've outlined of the, the four steps you really need to start thinking as you want to go for, you know as you want to process your data for machine learning right so the first it starts off with the machine learning model i mean you need to have a model um these models today are very very um, very common there are ml libraries that you know the, the big hyperscalers have and there is otherwise so that's not easy that's the easy part so for any problem chances are you already have an ml model you need to recognize images or videos or sound you know there are ml models for that so you pick a model maybe you pick three or four models and then out of that you select the best model so firstly you know pick pick an pick an ml model and then using your data we have got to we got to train the model once you've built and trained the model, you deploy the model, right? And once you deploy, typically you also want to deploy it on a mobile device so that people can make decisions, you know, um, uh, right at the point of service or sales. And then, of course, the model has to be updated because, you know, every day new input data is generated, the data characteristics change, so you have to update the model. So, Srini, do you want to highlight anything that is of particular interest in this journey, in this from build to update and that whole loop? Um, there's not much I can add to what you already very nicely put here, Alok. So I'll just uh, probably, um, uh, uh, you know, just round it off a little bit by saying that, see, the way we are looking at it is a person who is an operations person will just do their job. And we want to make this data gathering synonymous with their doing their job. And that way, the building and training and the deployment and the uh, access from the mobile and the update are all seamlessly blended with each other so that everything happens in a way that is very transparent and easy for the end operator. And any data science person can also smoothly plug in without any friction. Okay, so let's spend a couple of minutes on this because when we were talking to customers, you know, these frequently these things came up to, you know, this was on their mind. So, for example, ML models, right? Um, can, from my understanding, is that for our the way we are going to market uh, is a customer can either bring their own ML model, or we can help them, uh, or we can bring an ML model to them. It doesn't really matter. Uh, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. So, but that's wanted to make that clear. So, if you have your own model, please bring them along. We can incorporate them. And you can we can enhance them with our models, and together we can figure out the model that you know is best suited for your for your use case. In terms of training the model, um, how much data does one need, um, Shwini? So let's say let's give a make it tangible. Let's say I'm you know I'm in on the oil rig or I'm on a ship and I have assets to manage, right? I have maybe a a pump or a top drive. Um, how much data do I need to get that first model ninety with ninety percent probability? Um. In this case, uh, I can view an actual example of something that we've done in the past and where we had to deal with a collection of videos and uh, these were continuously coming in every day. And uh, we had to find out uh, you know, whether certain actions were being done or not. And in this case, in about a couple of weeks, it came to a 90% uh, accuracy. And uh, this was about two weeks of usage. Now, I'll put on the uh, engineer's cap and say that this two weeks, it might take the people you're talking about, Alok, it might take them less than two weeks or it might take them more, but this is just a data point for us to go with. Okay, good. So 
because sometimes you know people are worried they're like oh my god i mean how do i generate do i need a one year of data and where is all this data so the answer is really if you have two weeks of operating data you know one can actually train a decent model uh, or, or train a model decently at about 90 percent probability all right then the other thing that people um, you know want to know is this whole thing of the updating the model right so there is this whole idea of model drift uh, where because the data is changing and I don't know, maybe other parameters are changing, uh, the model drifts. So can you talk a little bit about how the ML model is not static? It's not like build one strain and you are done, but how does the model drift happen and how can one overcome that or resolve it? Certainly. The, the way it normally happens is first, I'll just explain what model drift is. Now, what we do is fundamentally train our systems to uh, you know substitute for human perception. And if you see something, uh, let's say that in an oil rig, uh, I, I don't work in the oil industry, so I'll just assume that there is some condition that you want to observe. And uh, maybe it's a leak, maybe it's something else, uh, I don't know. So you train it to do certain things using a collection of images. Now, over a period of time, the inputs might change and the relationship between the input and output might change. This is what is usually called model drift because the model slowly stops being accurate. In order to deal with that, what we've done is, because we've blended with operations, this model drift will be continuously addressed. Perhaps your model is getting trained every night, maybe every week, maybe every couple of days. So it continuously moves along with the changes that are happening in the environment, and so the accuracy will be kept up. And the way we do it is because of the way we operate, which is to blend the creation of the data for training with the people doing their regular work. Did I answer your question, Alok? Yes, and so the model gets updated, and then the updated model has to be pushed back, right? So, but before we go there, let's talk about where it, where it has to be pushed. So, most of our customers are, uh, you know, want to deploy these ML models on mobile devices, right? Tablets and phones, because that is where the field, the the, the person in the field, right? She's out there in the oil rig or at a plant. They need to use this model on mobile devices, right? Yes, you train the model in the backend server, you know, heavy computing, but it has to be consumed or used at the at the uh, on in the field on mobile devices, and so and that is also there are some challenges to that. There are some uh, you know ways you have to do that. So, for example, if you want to deploy it on iOS, Android, and let's say the Windows, all three platforms, you know, you have to do some um, last mile tweaks to make this. Uh, ML model work on each platform. It's not like you build the, you know, you mobilize the ML model once and it runs on all mobile platforms. No, there is some effort, and I think customers should be aware of that. There is some effort to enable these models to be consumed at each different operating OS level. There are some ADKs, SDKs uh, to be used, right? So there is some effort there. Similarly, if you want to do it for the web, so so you will have to put some effort for each mobile uh, operating system uh, that you will want to um, leverage. But so now, Srini, the model is used, is being deployed on the mobile adva uh, mobile devices, and now you have to update it. So how does the update happen from the model on the server back to the mobile device? Okay, this happens because the because you have a, a collection of programming intelligence and other things because of the mobile app that you have, you can easily have the mobile app itself periodically check with the server to see if there are any model updates that are worth pulling back into the phone, into the, into the device. And so every time the user logs in or at a, is at a place where connectivity is reestablished, then they can check it and then bring it back. This way, the end user gets the benefit of the latest without really having to do anything at all because the mobile software takes care of all of that. Right. And the key here really is the, and we haven't used this word till now, offline. Um, because there was some, um, we had to do some research to figure out if these ML models can be used on mobile devices in an offline fashion, and the answer is yes. So imagine the power of being able to use these ML models on mobile devices in an offline fashion, and and um, so and this is not very unlike the mobile apps that a lot of you guys are already using the whole offline concept. But we can do the same thing with ML models also. So let's talk about some potential use cases. Um, and we'll actually maybe um, talk about one of them just so that, you know, to give people a flavor for what, uh, you know, uh, make it more real, I guess. But the use cases are actually, you know, uh, uh, many, right? So asset inspections is one easy one. Um, you can have it in manufacturing on the shop floor, computer vision and quality control uh, in supply chain, customer service, 
you know, it, it, it could be used anywhere. But we want to just start off and give you an example of where we've been talking to one of our customers. So um, this customer has a lot of assets in the field. Um, uh, frequently, uh, you know, they have to work in, in settings where there is no connectivity. So offline is, uh, you know, offline capable is, is very important to them. And um, so here was their, uh, the use case. So today they have people who are in the field and they look at the asset, right? And they have to rate the asset, let's say on a scale of one to 10. So today they take a picture of, let's say it's an oil pump, they take a picture and they look at the picture and the human is actually out there in the field and making a decision, hey, this is eight, really bad, take it out of service, replace it. Or it's two, it can go on for another, I don't know, one more year. So a human is doing that. So what our customer wants to do is, is replace this human judgment with a ML model on the mobile app, right, right there. So that now instead of the human, it's the model rating the picture as seven or two or eight. And now the decision is being taken by the by the machine learning model. And you know, the first question that came to my mind was I was asking the customer, are you sure that are you going to trust a, a, an ML model to actually make a decision whether to take an asset in or out and you know that's got ramifications for revenues for customer service and and the answer was absolutely because humans do make errors and uh, they have faith that the machine learning model will certainly not do worse than humans in fact maybe better so they are ready to actually replace this human decision making with an ml ml based judgment so that's a real real life customer use case and so Hopefully this will set you thinking about what use cases you could have, uh, but we just wanted to highlight a specific use case, um, you know, to kind of make the conversation a bit more interesting. So let's talk about the, the solution. So what is the unwired and hypercurve solution? So there are two parts to this. So hypercurve and, and Shrini, as he was describing, is, is has the software, right, which is a cloud service, essentially to infuse, as we say, AI into operations. So the whole focus of our solution is really on the operations team. You can use it anywhere, but uh, if you are out there in the field, right, inspecting, or you are doing insurance, you know, um, or, or or assessments for you know claims management and all that, it's it's that kind of field scenarios where we are really focusing on. And the value proposition is that it quickly enables anybody in the field to input data to the model, even as they are performing their work. So let's say they are inspecting a piece of equipment. You know, they have to take a picture and then they are, you know, looking at it and seeing what needs to be done. But at the same time, that picture is quickly uploaded to the uh, digitizer platform so that it can now feed the model and, uh, and the model can be updated and improved, you know, on a daily basis, on a periodic basis. It also allows for human expert intervention uh, so that the model is, you know, correctly updated. So with that, um, Shrini, do you want to highlight some of the aspects of digitizer and especially the human, how where the human comes in and, and anything else you think, you know, is, 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 is important? Thank you, Alok. So in this case, when we say infuse AI into operations, what we are trying to do is to make the act of the human doing their regular activity synonymous with the activity of providing data for training to the model. In this case, for example, the uh, human might go and click a photograph from their phone and then perhaps give it a label saying that this asset is uh, nearly gone or it's okay or in whatever terms they want to describe it. Now this data is of two uses. One of course is the system with the model that's already there would end up saying, making a pronouncement on it. And if the human is not in the middle of the bell curve, but they're actually on the tail end where they, they are an expert, they would actually go ahead and correct it. And that correction will get carried over to the system that night so that uh, it can get trained a little bit better. So it would tweak itself a tiny bit that night. And over a period of time, what happens is that the best of human judgments out there among the operators is carried over and it's absorbed into the model so that the people in the middle and the other tail of the bell curve will not have a problem. Great, okay, so this is very important. This is not a runaway train. There will be human experts and the checks and balances to make sure that the model is, is doing what it does and it in fact improves uh, uh, things um, as time goes along. Okay, great. And so the unwired piece comes in, in terms of integrating these ML models with mobile devices. So we will make these models work on iOS, Android, Windows, and web. As I said, it's not trivial. There is some work to be done to enable these models to be used offline in mobile devices. So that's the combined, together we, 
have the solution, which is the platform to enable the, the operations to staff to really use it and to update the model at the same time. So it's really hitting the machine learning operation side of things. Like I just want to reiterate a point that Alok made, except that I think it's uh, vital to do it. The, the importance of the uh, Unwired's mobile app cannot be overstated. The reason is it's critical, sometimes even vital, because this actually bridges the gap between the uh, user and the server. The reason is there are many places where the uh, connectivity can be sporadic. Well, I think we are seeing an example of it right now, but there are places where this is the norm rather than the exception, where I've seen places where sometimes the connectivity is non-existent or it comes to a few KBPS. Those of us who know from the old phone lines, uh, uh, internet connectivity could probably relate to that. Under such circumstances, the mobile app is more than critical. It's actually vital because without it, the whole thing simply doesn't work. This was the point that I wanted to add. Actually, as we are continuing, I just want to point out that what is happening right now is probably the best uh, you know, uh, illustration of the need for a mobile app in the middle because this is exactly what will happen when, say, a user tries to connect to the uh, system from uh, their, let's say, their browser. And this is exactly what will happen. And to, it's to prevent this that you need the mobile app in the middle. No, so I was just saying that we wanted to make sure that you understood how we are different. So the hyperscalers have a lot of solutions. And our goal is really the target audience is the field workers, right? And focus is operations. And we really want to make your uh, you know, life easier, demystify this and get, get you guys started with a POC, low cost, right? Um, go live in four to six weeks. Um, that's what we really want to do is to keep the cost low and really enable your journey. So how do you get started? So essentially, you know, we, we'll help you select a, a use case that makes sense, right? We'll help you define the output of the model. What inference does one need to make? Do you need to make? What is the input data for the model? How much do you need? Is it two weeks? Is it four weeks? You know, we'll help you with that. We'll help you choose a model. You can bring your own model or we can bring our models. We'll take your data to train them. That's what we want to do. We'll help you deploy them either on the Hypercurve cloud. We have our own cloud or you can deploy it on any cloud of your choice. If you are working with AWS or Amazon or, or you know Google, it doesn't matter to us. We are cloud agnostic. We'll help you with the model updates. As the model drift happens, we talked about it. Make sure that the models are updated. Make sure that if they are integrated so that people can use them on mobile devices. So we, we'll help you with that. And typically, it's about two to three months. That's what we feel a typical POC should be. And we also want to be transparent about the cost. We are looking at a discounted. We'll give you a discounted price. So between three and $5,000, our promise is that we will help you execute a POC, an ML POC with your data, with a use case that you care about. So that's how we want to get started. And that's the end. Um, Let's open up for questions then. So, so you mentioned like one of the key things um, that's really critical is having the model you know, on the mobile device. Um, so is there, would we run into a situation where the model is too big or too complex to be stored on the mobile device? No, you would not. So we've done our research and uh, Srini, you can, you can probably, yes. the answer is no, but Srini, can you add a little bit more technical? Yes, yes, I can. So the answer to your question is, when you have a model, you can actually have a variability in the size of the model. Ultimately, this model is about having a huge collection of parameters, numbers. Now, if you have more numbers, obviously the model is more accurate, but it takes more of your space. If you have fewer numbers, it's basically less accurate and takes less space. So what we would do typically in those circumstances is to adjust it in such a way that you get the accuracy you want with due caveats that you'll actually get when it's being run and against the amount of space that it would take. And typically these days, because the phones are getting better, uh, you would be able to meet your needs reasonably well most of the time. In fact, maybe almost all the time. Okay. Thanks, Shwini. Okay. And by the way, as a reference, Chat GPT has 175 billion parameters with a B. So these models can be very complex. But anyway, any more questions? Does video work 
uh, as opposed to a photo? Yes. Uh, and typically what happens is you use the videos for certain use cases. Would you Do you have a use case in mind? Uh, yeah, uh, aircraft seats. Uh, you mean videos instead of uh, audios? Uh, I don't quite understand. So no, so videos instead of pictures. Yeah, yes, of course. You can handle videos just as well as you do pictures. I mean, if you think about it, a video is simply a, a sequence of pictures. Yeah, so... So if I wanted to, if there are 150 seats on an aircraft, instead of taking 150 individual pictures, uh, I could take a video? Yes, because they would simply be a sequence of pictures. Okay. And the idea here is to look for defects in seats. Uh, Shrini, to give you some background. So if you're looking for a seat defect, is it torn or not? That's the idea. Take a video of the all the seats, I guess. Is that right, Andy? And detect for any defects? Yes. Right. So, so Srini, I guess that's the thought there. Yeah, uh, that would be uh, uh, a good use case to do. Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. So, any more questions? Uh, I got a quick question. Um, is there a requirement for knowing how to prompt for your what you're looking for? Does that make sense? Prompt like chat Sorry? GPT? Yeah, like, you know, a good example is that last question around airplane seats, you know, um, do I, in my business, need to know how to, you know, say this is a, an example of a defective seat so that the machine learning can understand what is a, uh, uh, I guess, a proper one versus, a, well, a quality one versus a defective one? Yes. These are the in qualities fact, I is, need? Uh, in fact, this is exactly what you would call annotations. So what you would do is you would uh, take these uh, sequence of photographs and you would say from this point to this point, it's actually a defective seat and uh, the rest are all clean, something like that. So do I annotate the qualities of that seat? So I say the cushion needs to look like this, the springs under that cushion should be at this height, uh, the fabric should be at this wear, you know, like do I have to annotate little things or is it the machine learning will just understand that? Uh, based uh, on the, the number of quality photos I take or videos? So in this case, what you would do is you would actually uh, determine what it is that you want the system to detect, and or rather you between you and your team. And what would happen is you would probably put in a set of categories into which it would fall, uh, seats torn or seats dirty, or uh, I'm just making these things up. Now, what would happen is when you go and... Uh, check out this video and then you're going to go look at this video you would say these are all the problem you know between this point and this point every every image that you see is uh, is got a tear something like that and then it would have enough data to train on and for tearing did i answer your question yes and bob we can follow up more with you also so okay all right so the but Shrini, the whole idea is that the machine learning mod that the that the model learns with a bunch of data, right? So we would give them several videos of the image and build the parameters and train the model to look for things, right? That's exactly right. And uh, it's it's actually easier than it sounds, but because we're just talking in words, uh, it's kind of hard to illustrate. But effectively, that's what you would do. You would say these are the things that we need to look for that the system that the model needs to look for. And then here are examples where, look, this is how it's this way and this is not this way and so on. And once you do that, then it's just a matter of getting enough data to train the model. You have two minutes to do a demo. Uh, I could potentially do that. So let me try and share my screen. Yeah. So we have mm -hmm. a demo which actually, Bob, to your point, we can show you how the images are labeled, et cetera, right? So I think the solution, it will make it more real also. Uh, let's see if you can see my screen. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. So in this yeah. case, what I'm going to do is uh, a made up example because that's all I can do sitting in my office over here. So I will uh, ask you to imagine that you guys are, uh, you know, some kind of a home inspector. You, for whatever reason, want to go and click photographs in a home and then maybe to evaluate a home. And uh, you want to detect certain surfaces. Maybe it's a wooden flooring, so you want to click on something and say, this is wood, and then a wall, I'll just assume it's stucco, and you want to say it's stucco, and so on. So what I want to show you is how quick 
it is to set up something over here. And of course, in real life, you would actually have a mobile app also doing this. But here, I'm just going to show you what's called a progressive web app, which is something that helps you get started right away until the mobile app comes on, because it's not like uh, they can create a mobile app in a few seconds. It'll take them a little bit of time to create one. So here, in terms of the inspection, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll just create something we call templates. And in this case, it's to detect surfaces. And uh, so once we create this, I'm just going to uh, go and configure it and say that uh, in this case, I'm going to create a couple of labels here. And one of the labels is uh, what I'd call is wood. And I'll pretend the wood is always brown. And uh, since it comes from trees, I'll basically put a picture of a tree over here and create a label for wood and then another one for, say, stucco. And in stucco, I'll pretend it's yellow. And because houses are made from stucco, so, or rather at least the walls are, I'll just call it stucco. Now, if you notice, it took hardly any time to do this. One other thing is, uh, maybe as, a, as an inspector of a home, you want to say whether the house is you know, good, fair, poor, something like that. So what we'll do is we'll just put something else called condition. And it's fairly simple. And uh, by the way, you may not even do these things because we might set it up for you. And once you have these conditions, you just want to enable the person who is entering the data to say, you know, uh, what is the condition of the house? And so you end up uh, saving it. And then over here, uh, you would give option values of good, fair, poor, something like that. And again, I'm just making these things up. Now, that is all it takes. Once you do this, then from your uh, device, you should be able to send data provided you have a valid account. And that's exactly what I'm going to illustrate right now. And I'm going to stop sharing this and share my phone. I'm going to come here from the progressive web app. This is not a mobile app. It just looks like a mobile app, but it's really a browser. And the first time you log in using your password and then the second time onward, it's just uh, you know using your fingerprint or whatever your phone allows you to do. The one that I created here is surfaces. So I'm going to click a photo and over here, uh, this is the first hint you get that it's not a mobile app. And I'm going to click a photo over here, and <clears throat> I'm going to call it wood. And because we asked them to tell what the house was, we basically say that this is basically it. So that's all it takes to start off and send a uh, data into the into the system. Now I'm going to go here, and when I look at the surfaces again, I've actually sent this right now. This is what I sent in, and it's also labeled correctly. And let's pretend that it wasn't labeled correctly. So the expert who is on the tail end, the right tail of the bell curve, can come in and actually change it offline. And then this can be used for training, because right now what will happen is you can actually create something like this. And none of these things are things that you'll be doing. We'll be doing it for you. But this is just to illustrate how easy it is to do it. So these are templates for machine learning models. And once we get these, you can actually create an instance. And I'll just call that a demo. And once I create it as a demo, I'll just choose the default values. And if you have any data scientists, they would know instantly what it is that we're doing. And once this is a demo, then we can even schedule to run it every night or something like that. And we can figure out what the performance is quite easily. And if you guys noticed, it took me about two minutes to go from scratch to a point where people can start entering data or a data scientist can put in one of these templates and create it. And of course, there's nothing to stop people from entering their own ones too. And uh, again, all of these things are things that we would do. This is just to illustrate to you how easy it is. And if you have data science teams or even regular operations people, they can participate in it quite easily. And, uh, and instead of the uh, mobile app, which can be used when places, uh, in, in times and places where there's no connectivity, Somebody at the back end, somebody who is a, an expert sitting at the office, can log in using our regular uh, web app to go ahead and uh, make any changes to work with it anywhere else. That actually concludes the demo, so I don't have anything Great. else to add. Thanks, Srini. So I think maybe uh, let's end the call slowly here. I mean, in about 30 seconds, just a reminder. So, you know, if, if you don't have a data scientist, no issue. Srini actually 
was working at Microsoft. He's a data scientist and we have the platform. So we just want to have a conversation with you guys, help you select the use case. And, uh, you know, let's let's start a MLPOC. Um, that is what our ask is. And we just want to work with you on or, or, or collaborate with you on that journey. So if, is there, if there's any last or any pressing question, please uh, let's open up to the audience. Any last question that you just have to ask right now? Just a quick question. I mean, like earlier you said, you know, your solution is a lot less expensive. Uh, what does that mean compared to what? Compared to the hyperscalers that you would typically get from Amazon or Google, because by the time you end up using all their services, it really adds up. And I think this is where we need to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion, but based mm. on our research, that's the whole value proposition because their job is to make sure you consume as much data as you want, right? Our mm. focus is to enable, you know, infuse AI. We are not trying to maximize the cloud compute. So that's what typically happens. Okay, that's a good point. All right. Okay. All right, then thanks. Let's conclude this webinar. Thank you everyone for attending. We'll follow up with the slides and, um, and see if we can do a POC with some of you. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.